we're going to talk here about dacryocystitis, and uh, I apologize in advance. Uh, you may hear some uh, howling behind me. It's about uh, 20 degrees below wind chill here, Fahrenheit, and uh, we got some really strong 40 mile an hour winds. Uh, so that may uh, be heard in the background. All right, uh, we'll briefly touch on some anatomy. Uh, then we'll go into dacryocystitis in detail. There's both an acute and chronic form of dacryocystitis. We'll talk about the treatment approach, which is important to be aware of because it varies based on the patient presentation. And then we'll talk about some other problems of the lacrimal system, which are a little bit less common, or I may have touched on, touched on them elsewhere in other lectures. Uh, so we'll talk about some other things, but mostly we're going to focus on dacryocystitis here. So this is the anatomy of your lacrimal system, and you of course start out with the lacrimal gland, which is located in the lacrimal fossa as part of the temporal bone, uh, or sorry, part of the frontal bone, and it also uh, extends into the uh, into the temporal bone as well. Uh, this secretes tears uh, over the eye uh, and on the surface of the conjunctiva, and it drains into these two puncta. Here, which are located on uh, both eyelashes. So you have a superior lacrimal punctum and an inferior lacrimal punctum. And this then drains through these, uh, through these lacrimal uh, ducts and into this lacrimal sac, which is a superior dilation of the nasolacrimal duct. And ultimately, the nasolacrimal duct will drain tears into uh, the inferior meatus. So this is why, for instance, when you're crying or when you're excreting extra tears, you usually have to blow your nose because you have excess tears draining down into the nose. That's the way uh, we get the tears out. Anytime you put something in, it's got to come out somewhere. So the lacrimal gland is uh, provided with arterial circulation by the lacrimal artery, which comes from the ophthalmic artery, and the ophthalmic artery is the very first branch of the internal carotid artery. It receives innervation from multiple sources. It gets sensory innervation from the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. Uh, and then it also receives both parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation. The parasympathetic innervation comes from the greater petrosal nerve, which is a branch of the facial nerve. And sympathetics come from the deep petrosal nerve, uh, ultimately uh, from the vidian nerve. All right. So the lacrimal gland can actually be seen if you retract the superior eyelid uh, enough. Uh, I wouldn't recommend doing this to your patient unless you really need to. It looks pretty uncomfortable, uh, but the lacrimal gland can be seen. And this is the palpebral portion of the lacrimal gland, so it's the more inferior portion. Uh, this portion right here it can be seen if you retract the, the eyelid enough. So there's, uh, when, when you have dacryocystitis, it ultimately comes from an obstruction of the nasolacrimal duct. And there's two different ways that you can get nasolacrimal duct obstruction. It can be primary or it can be secondary. When it's primary, unless it's in a baby, we typically don't know the cause. So there's two patients who get primary acquired nasolacrimal duct obstruction either little babies or middle-aged to middle age to older women. So when it's in babies, it's typically due to a congenital malformation, a uh, stenosis of the nasolacrimal duct or something else. And this is in about 5% of babies. And typically when babies present with dacryocystitis, it is due to a congenital malformation. When it's in older or middle-aged women, it's usually idiopathic. Uh, and this is something that they are at risk for. Women are at three times uh, elevated risk as men are. In secondary acquired lacrimal duct obstruction, we have a cause. So usually it's due to infection, uh, directly due to infection. So it can be bacterial. Uh, usually it's going to be uh, staph. It can be viral, herpes virus, or it can be fungal, and usually that's going to be candida. It can also come from the chronic inflammatory disease, especially Wegener's, uh, as well as sarcoidosis and lupus. Uh, 
foreign bodies and trauma can also cause obstruction just due to uh, either the foreign body itself or uh, due to uh, swelling or uh, bony impediment. And then it can also be caused from medications. The chemotherapeutic agents that cause uh, obstruction or nasal lacrimal duct obstruction usually aren't used as much anymore. But the topical anti-glaucoma drugs that are used very commonly uh, can lead, lead to nasal lacrimal duct obstruction. So here we're talking about the beta blocker timolol, dorazolamide, and uh, pilocarpine, which is a uh, parasympathomimetic. And then radiation can also cause obstruction just due to tissue damage. So dacryocystitis is, in most cases, an infection of the lacrimal sac uh, and the nasal lacrimal duct due to obstruction of the nasal lacrimal system. It's always due to an obstruction of the nasal lacrimal system. When it's acute, it's always an infection. It's always some kind of infection that's causing it, uh, that's present. When it's chronic, uh, it may just be obstruction and no infection, and so there may not be uh, those fulminant signs of infection. So uh, let's talk about this in greater detail. So in acute dacryocystitis, the patient is typically going to present with epiphora, and epiphora just means tearing, excess tears. Uh, not necessarily due to excess production of tears, but the fact that you can't drain your tears, and so they're coming out your, down your face. Uh, and then also a swollen, tender medial canthus. And the medial canthus is just the medial, uh, the medial edge of the eye. And this is right where those uh, lacrimal ducts sit. And that's inflamed. And so that swollen, tender medial canthus is due to infection. Uh, there's also overlying cellulitis and possibly an abscess. Uh, and that cellulitis can extend all the way down the, uh, the distance of the nasal lacrimal duct, so down along the, uh, the lateral aspect of the nose. You also may see mucopurulent discharge. You usually will. This can either be uh, present just on looking at the patient, or it can be expressed if you gently manipulate uh, the edge of the nose uh, down the anatomic uh, boundaries of the uh, nasal lacrimal duct. You should also look for orbital cellulitis. That's not going to be present in all patients. However, when orbital cellulitis is present, you're going to be admitting the patient all the time. So you need to look for that. Signs of orbital cellulitis, uh, among other things, would be, uh, for instance, the patient wouldn't be able to move their eye. Uh, so that may be present. Uh, but it's very important to look for orbital cellulitis. In severe cases, systemic symptoms can be present, uh, fever. And then uh, in acute dacryocystitis, the symptoms tend to be unilateral, so this tends to affect one eye. Now, on the other hand, chronic dacryocystitis is due to obstruction. There may be a low, uh, a mild infection, but that doesn't have to be the case. So this is due to obstruction. Uh, and uh, so with these patients, you'll have long-standing epiphora because you have obstruction, and that obstruction is either due to idiopathic causes or it's due to an anatomic defect. And so this obstruction doesn't go away, so they're going to have long-standing epiphora. Uh, like I said, you may also have some low-grade swelling or signs of a mild infection, but what sets this apart from the acute form is that this is long-standing, it doesn't go away, and there tends to be a lot less pain than with acute dacryocystitis. Uh, here the symptoms tend to be bilateral, but they don't have to be. So this is a woman with dacryocystitis, and you can see here that there's inflammation uh, at, the medial canthus, at the medial canthus and then down uh, along what appears to be uh, the uh, lateral aspect of the nose. And this might be bilateral here, and that would, be, that would make sense uh, in this case, if this is a chronic case, uh, because women uh, are at risk of, uh, of getting that idiopathic primary obstruction. Now here's a baby. You can see that this is unilateral, and this is, uh, this is probably due to an anatomic defect. Uh, but this is acute dacryocystitis in this case. And then here's another baby here. All right. 
So the diagnosis of dacryosis can be made clinically, especially if you're able to express that pus. That's a very, very, very uh, obvious sign that you've got an infection going on. Uh, but it, it can be made clinically. However, uh, certain labs and imaging tests are useful for determining the etiology or underlying cause, since there are several possible causes of dacryocystitis. So you don't have to do these tests, but some of these are recommended. Uh, so you're almost always going to want to get a culture of the pus or of the ocular surface. Uh, definitely in cases of acute dacryocystitis, and the reason for that is we want to know exactly what bacteria is causing this so that if the, uh, if the dacryocystitis does not respond to antibiotics, uh, we can, if we know what the bacteria is, we can change the antibiotics appropriately. There's also something called the fluorescing disappearance test. In this case, what you're doing is you're just putting some dye along the medial canthus, and you're looking for it to drain. And if it drains, that's a normal test because the, uh, the lacrimal ducts are, uh, are supposed to drain what's ever in that area. But if they don't drain, then it's clear that there's some kind of obstruction. And so this test can be done to confirm uh, or support your diagnosis. Imaging should be done, uh, especially if trauma, an anatomical defect, or a neoplasm is suspected. Uh, and so the various things that you can get here are plain films, uh, which would be partic particularly recommended in cases of trauma where you may have a, a bony problem. Uh, CT can be done, uh, and then a dacryocystogram can be done. And that really helps you look at uh, the ductal system and, uh, and look to see if there's any anatomic defects. When should you suspect a neoplasm? You should always suspect a neoplasm if there's any kind of blood involved. So if you have bloody tears, definitely suspect a neoplasm. And then other tests that you can get if you suspect chronic inflammatory disease, uh, C-ANCA will help you with Wegener's granulomatosis, ANA will help you with lupus. So the treatment approach, uh, in acute dacryocystitis, antibiotics are the cornerstone of therapy, and then any additional management is based on the disposition of the patient. So what you have to look for, and I alluded to this earlier, is orbital cellulitis. If that is present, uh, then you need to admit the patient. They need to be in the hospital. You can also admit them if there's complicating factors, so if the patient appears really ill, if uh, the patient has a compromised immune system, uh, if the patient can't take care of themselves at home, uh, then you can admit them uh, for those reasons as well. But orbital cellulitis, you always need to admit the patient uh, in the setting of dacryocystitis. We're going to give them broad-spectrum antibiotics, uh, something like cephazolin would be useful, uh, as well as antibiotic drops. And you can use, uh, there's lots of different antibiotic drops, but uh, gentamicin and tobramycin uh, drops are, uh, tend to be used the most. If there's no orbital cellulitis uh, or significant illness, then the patient can be discharged and put on PO antibiotics, but those antibiotics should at least cover penicillin-resistant staphylococcus. So uh, that can be something like uh, Keflex or uh, amoxicillin clavulane. I tend to not use that ever because it gives patients really bad gut ache and diarrhea. Uh, in pediatric patients, you can use cefaclor. Uh, and then also you want to be giving these patients antibiotic drops too. So we're approaching this systemically and we are approaching this topically, locally. In all patients, symptomatic treatment is useful. So you can give them ibuprofen for pain, warm compresses, helps uh, relieve any abscess if it's there, uh, any inflammation, gets things moving. And then you should also refer the patient for an elective dacryocystorhinotomy. Uh, and this would be done uh, usually by an ENT. Uh, there's uh, the dacryocystorhinotomy. Uh, there's also, in the last 10, 15 years, uh, a balloon dacryoplasty, and this is less invasive, and actually it has been uh, shown in some literature to be more uh, effective. And the balloon dacryoplasty is exactly the way it sounds. You're going in uh, backwards, through the nasolacrimal ductal system with a balloon, and you're inflating it to uh, expand the nasolacrimal duct.
In some cases, if the patient has an abscess, it doesn't respond to antibiotics, uh, they may need an incision and drainage. In the case of chronic dacryocystitis, uh, you can use topical steroid drops. Uh, prednisolone ophthalmic is typically what's used, uh, and that's uh, the cornerstone of therapy in chronic dacryocystitis. Um, and this is, again, because typically chronic dacryocystitis is not caused from an inflammation. Or, sorry, it's not, well, it's not, it's not caused from an infection. So you're, you don't need to use antibiotics most of the time in chronic dacryocystitis. And then again here, you can uh, send the patient off for a referral uh, to get an elective dacryocystorhinotomy. Uh, so some of the other problems of the lacrimal system, uh, dacryocystocele, this is a cystic expansion of the nasolacrimal duct due to an obstruction. So you have an obstruction that's primarily there. And then secondary to that, because of the pressure that builds up, you get a uh, an expansion, a cystic expansion of the duct. And this is typically encountered in young children and infants. This can become infected, uh, and if it becomes infected, then it can cause blockage, and if blockage uh, becomes present, then you have a dacryocystitis. Involutional stenosis is that idiopathic nasal lacrimal duct stenosis that's typically seen in middle-aged and older female patients. Uh, again, this is idiopathic, and this is what puts older female patients at a higher risk for dacryocystitis. Dacryoadenitis is an inflammation of the lacrimal gland. So this is not anything to do with the nasal lacrimal duct. This is the lacrimal gland on that superior lateral side of the eye. And this is typically due to bacteria or virus. The reason I'm not talking about this in depth is because this isn't very common. Uh, not in the U.S. at least. Uh, so the bacterial causes uh, are typically staphylococcus or gonococcus, which, yes, can be sexually transmitted, uh, as well as streptococcus. The viral causes are mumps and the Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, so the Epstein-Barr virus, usually when uh, you're going to see dacryoadenitis, it will be in a setting of mono. Uh, with mumps, again, we don't see that a whole lot in the U.S. However, if you're a sports fan, you've been watching uh, in the National Hockey League, in the NHL, there have been several players that have come down with mumps in the last few months. Um, and this is probably due to a lack of immunization. And if you work in a family practice setting, uh, you will certainly run into those patients that don't believe in vaccination. This is a problem. Uh, there are more patients showing up with mumps uh, and other previously uncommon diseases now than in several, several years. And it's because of this growing idea that these uh, that immunizations are, are bad or a conspiracy from the government or what have you. Uh, so it's very important to be vaccinated. Uh, this is a, a dacryoadenitis is a complication of mumps. And then chronic inflammatory diseases, uh, again, like, uh, like Wagner's or lupus, uh, sarcoidosis, they can also cause dacryoadenitis. Sjogren's syndrome, of course, is that autoimmune destruction of the lacrimal gland. It can also affect the salivary gland. That's going to cause dry eye, chronic dry eye, as well as xerostomia. So here's a picture of a dacryocystocele. So you know that there's not a whole lot of inflammation going on here. You just have this little, uh, this little cyst here. Uh, this looks like it might be the beginning. This was labeled under dacryocystocele, but this looks like it may be the beginning of dacryocystitis. So there's this overlying erythema here, as well as something that looks like it might be drainage here, possibly pus or tears being blocked up that are causing these eyelashes to stick together compared on the other side. This is dacryoadenitis. So note that the problems here are on the superior and lateral side, whereas with dacryocystitis, the problems are on the medial side. So this is an inflammation of the lacrimal duct. And if you were to uh, expose the uh, superior palpebra of the patient, uh, you would probably see obvious inflammation.
Here's another case of obvious dacryl adenitis. So hopefully you can see the difference here. Dacryl adenitis is a lacrimal gland infection, very uncommon. Dacryocystitis is an infection of the nasal lacrimal duct, much more common. And this is on the medial uh, aspect of the eye. So if you have any questions, feel free to write me a comment below.